doing right now and welcoming to Cinema Showcase, Sally Field. Sally, it's good to see you again. Nice to see you. You know, if I've heard it once, I've probably heard it a dozen times from critics who have said that they're so pleased you've made the, the great leap from Gidget and the Flying Nun into more serious things. Are you tired of hearing phrases like that? <laughs> well, uh, yes, basically. <laughs> I, I sort of expect it because, I mean, it is kind of an extraordinary um, career that I've had. I've come from the kind of work that I came from to the kind of work I have the opportunity to do now. But I've been doing this for a while. I mean, I, I think it started with Sybil and that that's like, t what is it, eight to ten years mm -hmm. ago. And I start to think there must be something else we can identify <laughs> me with. Not because I mind be I being identified that way, I just get sort of tired because then I have to answer the same way I've done over the last uh, eight to ten years. Yeah. Do you compartmentalize your career that way? In other words, when you look back on it now, do you think of of everything preceable as being just that, or is it all sort of one continuous flow for you as an actress? It really is one continuous flow. I, somebody was asking me um, about those years, and it I sort of equate it to what uh, most people must feel about their the days that they had preparing themselves for what they wanted to do, like college or whatever work that you did to get to the place that you are now. I don't suppose you like set it off in a little area all by itself. You just think it's part of your process right. to, to be able to eventually do what you're doing. And whether that be where you want to end up or not, it's all a continuous process to eventually be 112 sitting yeah. on the porch thinking back, oh yes, that was my career. You know? So when you were, was it a conscious decision then to, to more or less change the type product you were doing uh, or did you feel all that time when you were doing Gidget and Fly Nun that you were growing as an actress? Oh, I always felt I was growing as an actress and I felt that those years were very very important because I wanted to act in film. I mean I always wanted to be a good actor but film is where my heart was and the way you uh, learn to act in film is to be in front of a camera, yeah. day in and day out and day in and day out when you don't feel good and you're too tired to do it and there's a certain technique that you have with a camera that you you have to learn how to do so that it can release you to do your work as an actor. So many times when people are really good actors on stage if they're unfamiliar with the camera, the camera gets in the way and it, it doesn't allow them the freedom to do what they're able to do on stage. Is it true, somebody once said, that the camera either loves you or it doesn't? Is that true? No, I don't think that's true. I think you either love the camera or you don't. Hmm. I think that's what happens. I think the camera can pick up when you're uncomfortable with it there, like an intruder in a private scene. And you have to learn how to welcome it in, how to almost forget that it's there. Not even forget that it's there. It's the fact that you have to learn to use it to love it, to want it there. I mean, not necessarily to want close-ups, but to know how to manipulate it in such a fashion that it enhances your work. It's been said that even some of the great stage actresses like Lynn Fontan and so forth, uh, Helen Hayes, even though she's done great films, uh, have been known to do, for want of a better term, exercises, just perhaps similar to what you were talking about, that they would stand in front of a mirror and make a particular gesture with their hand over and over again just to see how that gesture will will look either on stage mm -hmm. or on film and I think in a way isn't that what you're talking about of using the camera to your own best advantage? Uh, I think it is I mean I, it doesn't manifest itself in that kind of uh, behavior in, w in watching something about yourself and mm -hmm. repeating it I mean it, it, it it has to do with, with learning how to use the technical part and not ever letting it, I mean, there's, in film, it's it, so many times you're in a very emotional scene and yet you have to do some very awkward uh, gymnastics physically to get around to the camera. Don't look this way, don't do this, pull your head down that way, get into the camera. Well, if you do that wonderful moment, it may have been a wonderful moment, but the camera never picked it up. So you, you learn how not to waste yourself, mm -hmm. not necessarily to play everything directly into the camera because then again, that's not good. But, but uh, 
a way of, of sensing when when somebody's straying off of off of a, a position that's going to um, whatever wonderful thing is happening in the scene is going to be lost and a way of, of that your mind working at the same time thinking working on all your preparation but trying to figure out how to get everybody back around so that we're back into yeah. the, you know that kind of it's a whole technical mentality. process I remember a story Olivia de Havilland told about about Richard Burton in making his first Hollywood film my cousin Rachel and he was really at that time more or less unaccustomed to filmmaking even though he was one of the great stage actors in the early 50s um, and she said he would find that that he would really give his all in the master shot and then when it came to to the various close-ups and things he would find himself running out of steam and yeah. she gave him counsel that you know you don't have to waste everything and mm -hmm. then the master shot right that that is definitely one of the techniques I will always ask uh, when I did this film places in the heart the thing I always asked Benton Robert Benton before we would go into any scene we would prepare to shoot the first um, covered shot of a scene I wouldn't you know be going up usually and asking for um, you know motivation or whatever mm. you think actors that I wanted to know how many cover shots there were going to be uh, because then you know number one what how you have to maintain your energy you can you don't want to like let it out too soon and you I can also sort of see in my mind how he wants to edit it now it's not my right to uh, as an actor to visualize that and and act to what I think he's going to edit but in some ways I have to because yeah. I can't if I think that if I blow it all on a, on a far on a, on a very large master when really it's just for the establishing shot then uh, when it comes into the money as they say when it comes into where the, where the scene is really going to take off and be important I won't be there mm -hmm. um, so I really uh, it's my requirement as an actor to be able to um, guess when it's when the money's going to be there and to be able to deliver. How do you know when you're walking that line between intellectualizing a role and emotionalizing a role? How do you know when to cross over into each of those categories? Well, I I what I do is uh, when I approach a character like this. I intellectualize her all the way down the line until it until it comes time until it gets close to the to doing the work until it gets close to action a couple of days before a week before um, then all the preparation I've done intellectually on paper and with the logic and the and making it for life before I let go mm -hmm. and I know it will be there and then I work on bringing her to life through emotion and mm -hmm. what what Sally has been through right right um, what initially drew you to this this role it's it's a marvelous role I think and other than uh, the fact that it it offers you great uh, possibilities as an actress I assume there were other qualities in Edna that made you want to play her in, in actuality the first thing that drew me to this role was the entire script when I read the script I was I was very very moved it Surely is the best script, all in all, that I've read, and I've read some wonderful scripts and had the opportunity to be part of them. Uh, Norma Ray and Sybil were extraordinary mm -hmm. scripts, and but the entirety of this and what it was about um, on the human level was very touching to me, and I had never read a script that was quite that lyrical and intimate um, from Benton's heart yeah. and it wasn't until after I had the role after I met with Benton and he wanted me to do Edna that I really took a look at Edna and said hmm okay it sort of went to work on her but I never it's an ensemble and it's one of the things that's so lovely about it is it's not just specifically about Edna it's about five or six people and they're all very detailed you almost feel as if this is sort of a the, the movie is sort of a sublime intrusion on the lives of these people and that I think is the best possible cinema when you feel like you're um, politely intruding on on the lives of, of the people you're watching 
Yes, I agree. Um, we have a scene that I want to take a look at from uh, Places in the Heart, and this is a scene that features uh, Lindsay Krauss and yourself. What do we need to know about this scene before we take a look at it? Well, um, this is a scene that takes place early on in the picture. It's when my character, Edna, is coming to grips with what lay ahead of her. She's just lost her husband. She's uh, totally and completely unprepared for what may be the rest of her life. Um, it's at the end of the day that her husband has been killed and her sister and her have washed the body, mm -hmm. have done all of the things to prepare the dead. And Lindsay Krauss is the most extraordinary actress. You stand across from her and you know you're on stage with somebody. And there's a real love that happens between actors when you meet someone on stage and they face you and they say, come at me, mm -hmm. I'll act with you. And everyone in this cast had that, that feeling of love that happens with actors because it's like being in a war. And you, when your fellow soldier stands next to you tall and you know he's not going to let you down and vice versa, there's, there's a bond. And that's what happened with Lindsay and I. Mm -hmm. And the setting of the story is the, the mid-30s during the Depression mm -hmm. in Texas. Yes. Right? All right. Let's take a look at that scene right now. Here's a scene featuring Sally Field and Lindsay Krauss from Robert Benton's Places in the Heart. Okay, we're keeping going. Okay, still on a two shot. A scene from Places in the Heart featuring my guest, Sally Field. Sally, now you were talking before that clip about the, the bond between actors and, and the camaraderie can, that can exist. What about, um, wait till the Hindenburg flies over here. My head um, is being attacked. What about if the opposite happens in a film or on stage or whatever? Can you? Can you give a good performance? Can you give your all with actors whom you really just don't either like or whom, with whom you disagree? Um, I don't think you can give the same kind of work that you can when the actors uh, unite and, and uh, can feel that love for each other. Uh, I think that what happens is it becomes very internal. You're working by yourself and uh, you, you know, you might give an interesting performance by accident because there was, there's so much complication going on in trying to get to that other actor, presents certain complications, a certain fierceness to mm -hmm. try to get through that might add colors of, that, are, that are interesting if you just sort of go with it and play yeah. it or, or let it be. It certainly is not as much fun. Yeah, particularly when you, when you have to spend anywhere from three to five, six months on a project, it's good to know you're working with people you admire and they admire you. It's, it's a gift. It's a treat. It's like eating candy all day long. I still remember the story of uh, the several pictures Betty Davis made with Miriam Hopkins and they supposedly could not stand each other. And yet, fortunately, the, the scripts call for two characters who couldn't stand for each other, yeah. so that came across well yeah. on screen. Yeah. See, see, it can be interesting. Yeah. It, the acting is such a peculiar profession because sometimes the most unhappy circumstances makes for very interesting work yeah. because it's a, you know, acting is about people and the complications and the inner workings. So it, it's always best for an actor if he doesn't hit, go for his uh, character at right head on anyway, mm -hmm. you know, because then you just like anticipate it. But when you're in a situation that's causing turmoil and you're playing a very simple emotion, all of a sudden you have a sort of complicated performance, which might be interesting. You said when you first read the script, you were totally taken with the script, and it was only then that you discovered how, how good a part Edna was. Did you know right away how, what your approach to Edna would be, or did it take you some weeks into either rehearsal or into the actual filming to get a real grasp on just what you and what Bob Bitten wanted Edna to be? But Edna, without a doubt, was the hardest character that I've ever worked on for me because she can't, she comes from another era, number one, and her emotional makeup, I think, is different than, than mine in a lot of ways. Maybe not her actual makeup, but certainly the way she, uh, 
her modus operandi in life is, is different than mine. Um, I, the way I work anyway, I never allow myself to, to really find the character till the last possible second. Mm -hmm. Because if you, I feel if you find her too early, it's too, it, it, number one, it becomes old. And number two, it's, it's anticipated. If you, if you get there too early, it's because you, you paved the paths before they were walked on. You have, to, you have to sort of put all the ingredients together, throw it up the air, and just see where, take a chance and mm -hmm. see where it comes down. All right, now does that, <coughs> let me see if I completely understand. Does that mean you, you like, how do you feel about improvisation then on, on the set? Oh, we, it's a, a constant. It's a constant, certainly in rehearsals, mm -hmm. and most assuredly is the, the way to work. We, we uh, put the, we put their lives together. We, inv we invent, and then in this case, with the help of Robert Benton, say Lindsay Krauss and my, myself, we invented our entire childhood, uh, the two sisters. We invented uh, uh, what our parents were like and how, how in, under the same uh, environment, two people could, could, two sisters could be so totally and completely different mm -hmm. because that's, in more cases than not, how it is. And uh, how Lindsay had gone one way was the one that was uh, more of a rebel, was surely had more s sensuality than Edna, uh, was more emotional, uh, had, had decided to break some of the codes that had been set up as a parent and as a woman for that time. That's Lindsay Krauss had done that. Then my character, Edna, was the more traditional woman of her time really chose to be the lady of the house mm -hmm. and all those things. So it made it a little more difficult for Edna to make the transition that she had to make in the picture than it would have been if this same tragedy had happened to the Lindsay Krauss character. Yeah. So when we added all that logic, then Lindsay and I would just come in the room and improvise as sisters as to what our relationship would be to this day. And so a lot of it has to do with yeah. putting the logic together, walking in the room and being. So really, the ideal combination when you're on a set, when you're acting in anything, should be the, the combination should be intuition and technique. The, the two have to go together because there are often times that you can't just go out there and feel everything at every moment. You have to fall back on technique at some point. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's the technique that allows you to illustrate mm -hmm. the intuition. You can't see the, the instinct or the talent, or whatever it, whatever that word is, mm -hmm. without the technique. Right. It's what illuminates it. Yeah. What do you think gives you such a, and being a Southerner, I can say this, such a great affinity for playing Southern women? I don't know. I, I, maybe because my, my, uh, my mother and all my mother's relatives were born in the South, mm -hmm. and I was raised by them. Maybe that's partially it. There's somewhere in my mind, or maybe it's because there's a part of me that's very much, you know, that's quintessentially uh, average American citizen, uh, kind of a small town girl mentality, and I think that we, in in our stereotypes, or maybe not even. I mean, the South is very American. It is almost more American mm -hmm. than other parts of the country. Um, it's, it has a history that other parts of the country don't have. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a part of me that sort of plugs into that. Um, not, certainly not the history, but the, the average American Joe that mm -hmm. I am mm -hmm. fits into that part of Southern culture. The marvelous thing for me about watching you work when you're portraying a Southern character, and this is something that literally cannot be in the script is that you react as a southerner would. This is a very vague thing. I don't think I could probably describe it, but that is the case. Your reaction seemed to be that of a southerner. Well, if that is, it truly is instinct and it must come from the fact that my grandmother Joy, who helped raise me, was born in Alabama, raised in South Carolina and Georgia. My mother was born in Texas. My, my great aunt Gladys was born in Alabama. My great aunt Pearl was born in Alabama. And they were, they were, they were really my support group mm -hmm. when I was a child. And always, they were, they've been there in my life. Yeah. And I guess I see these, these women. I see how they react. 
I see how they raised me, I yeah. see how they loved me, and I, I know that's in my, my brain and my heart. Yeah. Let's talk in, in the remaining moments we have um, about a wonderful director you've worked with several times and will be working with again soon, and that's Marty Ritt, who I think has made some of the best films of the past 25 years. Um, and let me begin by asking you, what is the difference between working, maybe this is unfair, between working with a Marty Ritt or a Bob Benton? What separates the two? Hmm. Or Marty Ritt from anybody else? Well, you know, you, when, you, when you say uh, Robert Benton or Marty Ritt, you're talking about the two top artists uh, in my industry right now. I mean, one of two of the two, of, I mean, I don't know how many top artists there, but not very many. Mm -hmm. There's just a tiny, tiny handful of, of people who are as talented and uh, as generous and as intelligent and as experienced as Robert Benton and Marty Ritt. Um, they're the, as artists, they're, they're very different. They work very differently, but they have the same sensibilities. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, then on, I mean, there's, there, there are very few people in my industry that are, have that give degree me an, of talent. Give me an example, if you, if you can think back to, to the shooting of Norma Ray of of a particular a, a particular thing that Marty Ritt would do that another director might not do in terms of interpretation or, or giving you a particular bit of business to do something like that. Well, I, I would I would have to say that where Marty and and Robert Benton are s similar in this, and that is that that during the rehearsal period and and then throughout the shooting, they are so much a part of their actors that I would never. I would never be able to tell what information they were giving me and what came from myself. They were mm -hmm. never like people that came in and imposed something on you that you had to do and you were aware of the fact that you were being directed. They are always there, they are always supportive, and yet it feels like they are you too. Mm -hmm. I don't know what information came from Marty Ritt and what was mine. I don't know what information came from Robert Benton and what was mine. They direct you in such a way that you forget that you're being directed. It Which be is the best way, I is suppose. The, isn't it? Is absolute genius <laughs> because being, you know, being another human being and an actor with an actor's sort of ego and mentality, mm -hmm. if you if you, somebody comes in and is like directing you, you can't help but go, wait a <laughs> minute, you know, and you 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 find your you hear your ego standing up and saying, huh? I, I don't know that I want to be pushed around like this. <laughs> Even if the information they're giving you is very valid, it takes a moment to digest it when it comes at you like that. But both of them have some way that you don't even know you're being directed. Mm -hmm. That, As I said, that has to be the only way to work. I, for the life of me, have, have never been able to understand how actors can respond to truly dictatorial directors. And I know there are many, many of them out there. Yes. I, I thank goodness I've never had to work with one because I know that I would just be awful. I would be, I mean, <laughs> the people would like hear stories about it because I would, I don't think I would behave nicely. I think I wouldn't <laughs> like this. I think I would revert to being about nine years old, you know, and, and I don't, I'm not so sure I would be thinking about the work very much. Yeah. What is the, um, you're, you're about to do another film with, with Martin Ritt. What is that one? That one is out of my own production company. I mean, it's the first one that I've, my partner and I have developed. And the Ravitches, who wrote Norma Ray, wrote it. Mm -hmm. And Marty Ritt is going to direct it. It starts in January. It's called Murphy's Romance. It's really about relationships. It's a triangle. Mm -hmm. And it's about learning to choose the right person to fall in love with and not mm -hmm. constantly choose the wrong one out of a crowd, purposely just sort of picking the wrong guy and saying, I think you'll be bad for yeah. me. Let's fall in love. Is it a, a contemporary setting, or it's contemporary South? It's and it's the Southwest, mm -hmm. where the Ravages uh, work so well. Boy, I think where you all work so well. Oh. So, we are out of time. I want to thank you uh, very much for taking this time out, and sure. you certainly have a winner with Places in the Heart. And I'll look forward to your next film very much. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Ellen. Okay.